الاسم عندك واضح سيدي العزيز صح؟ عبد الغني جغمان ها؟ عبد الغني جغمان مين لكن اذا بدك بقرط وبحكي لك اياها عبد الغني جغمان كله خير كله خير اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اهلا وسهلا بكم Welcome back all of you all participants with us on Zoom and uh, we'd like also to welcome our viewers on different uh, platforms Twitter Facebook of the three foundations or centers that are organizing this uh, academic conference during this session, which is uh, the last session or panel four of the conference uh, in the past two days, we have addressed uh, a number of issues, topics that are important and relevant to the conflict in Yemen. And the participants or the speakers uh, addressed uh, the effectiveness of the peace process in Yemen and the different uh, dynamics in terms of the solutions that are proposed. And we have also talked about the regional roles, the local interventions or roles. And we, in, in part three, we talked about the creativity and the need for innovation in the peace process in order to create uh, more avenues and to have uh, perpetual solutions for the very complicated situation in Yemen. In this uh, session, the last one, which is uh, session number four, we'll be focusing on the future of Yemen, and we will uh, explore the future of Yemen on the basis or under uh, the assumption that there must be an end to this war and there will be reconstruction and recovery phase in Yemen the reconstruction and the development in the post-war era. And as you understand, in relation to the reconstruction after war, uh, we say that reconstruction after war might be more complicated and more difficult than the war itself. And sometimes it may not help in having a lasting peace in countries affected by war, be they civil or regional war or interstate wars. So in this session, we are very lucky as we have uh, three key academics or researchers who wrote about these topics. They are uh, specializing in Yemen. We have three speakers only, and this will give us ample time later on for discussion. And then I will try to present some concluding remarks and ideas. So we have in this session, we have Sabriya Thaur and Abdul Ghani Jarman and uh, Helen Lackner. Sabriya is uh, now in Sana'a in Yemen. Abdul Ghani is in Europe. And Helen Lackner, sadly, she cannot join us because of uh, certain conditions, but we have a recording for her and we'll be showing the recording of her presentation at the end of the session. So for every panelist, as usual in this conference, we'll give every speaker 15 minutes maximum, and then we will have time for Q&A. So if you allow me, I start directly with uh, Ms. Sabria. She will present a paper titled Opportunities and Challenges for Inclusive Recovery, Reconstruction and Development in Yemen. And the paper will discuss the possible approaches to engage the different actors at the local level, in particular, the role of the 
IDPs, the internally displaced people, their role in the recovery in the local peace process. Sabria Thaur is a lecturer and researcher in uh, Sana'a University in the fields of uh, humanitarian and issues and development and gender. She uh, focuses on development issues, uh, poverty, education, and uh, policy. Please uh, welcome Ms. Sabria, you have the floor. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. I tried uh, to show the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, important conference. And uh, excuse me, because I have prepared the slides in English and uh, I will deliver it in English, uh, but uh, I will have uh, also, I will answer to any questions in Arabic later on. Uh, my contribution, in a way or another, I'm, I'm really happy that it uh, it comes after uh, what has been discussed in the previous uh, session, because here I would like to focus more on the uh, local level, where we're talking about uh, what would be uh, the, um, the, the possibilities and potentialities of the local communities and uh, people, leaderships and other different social segments that have been really active during the war or the seven wars, doing a lot of different roles, what would be uh, the potentialities for them to be part of the uh, recovery and reconstruction? Uh, phase. Um, yes, I started. No. Uh, do you want me to start the video? Is it clear with you at the, the screen? You can see it? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah, because here I'm just asking me to uh, start my video later. Okay. So, um, and I would like to, to, to start with um, speaking for Paul Dirich talking about Yemeni people back in the 80s, the famous anthropologist describing Yemeni people saying that they are just simple, simple people are unlucky to be found in complicated circumstances and that's seeing still valid until today. And the, the conflict, you know, and even the instability that have been before the, um, the beginning uh, of the war, you know, is a, a good proof for that. Uh, to start with, uh, to be brief, I would try to focus on challenges and opportunities and then looking at different approaches uh, that I think in a way or another would be crucial and important uh, to uh, be adapted or to be part of uh, thinking for planning for the recovery and the uh, um, uh, reconstruction phase. The, uh, the challenges they would like to uh, highlight right now will be relevant also to the peace process negotiation. Uh, number one, it just issues of inclusion, and we have seen in the previous sessions how, and also in the comments and questions by different uh, uh, attendees talking about inclusion, how can we include people, why that high representation at Rakhon and diplomacy does not include different voices, including women, youth, and marginalized people, and so on. I know that there have been a lot of efforts to um, include women uh, since 2016, with not that much success and youth also are working right now through uh, civil society organization to get a voice of the youth and so on, but still not yet uh, that successful. And here we are talking about peace and sitting on the table of negotiation. Here I'm talking about not inclusion in the recovery and reconstruction uh, path, it's about people who are working to think together and being together, how to plan, what to plan, what would be our needs, how to start, when we start, who should be in, who should be out and so on. And many social segments are usually sidelined from that you know official negotiation and people don't know what's going on and that also um is reflected on the kind of issues and kind of focus uh, during the uh, past rounds of peace negotiation the other uh, key uh, issue is that the different tracks uh, they don't talk to each other, they don't communicate. The linkages are missing. So people on the ground and then the national cannot really, you know, try to, uh, cannot really trans um, transfer their messages, their concerns, try to influence uh, the diplomacy level is not happening. The grassroots participation is zero in the decision-making process or what is needed to be discussed and addressed. The recurrent escalation, and we have seen, you know, uh, during the past year and this year, on just escalation everywhere, with, in a way or another, creating more kind of local conflicts, sub-conflicts, more 
grievances and more violence. And this, in a, a way or another, threaten the uh, uh, participation and the engagement of different people and different segments on the ground, especially in some areas that, um, uh, and, and I think most of the areas really in Yemen, people are not able to voice their concerns and talk about their issues and uh, even try to uh, be part of what is decided to them, who is included, for example, in the aid or, for example, in projects or in the benefits, who is uh, not uh, there. So people really um, is still not, uh, the, the conflict and grievances is not helping people. And more uh, there is more generation of those grievances and conflicts. Other challenges is the economy. And you remember here, uh, my colleague Rafat, when he, in a, one of his articles he talked about you know the 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 problem with the Yemenis is not really the war itself and the conflict it's more the economy uh, it's another kind of war front uh, also the unaddressed development needs the focus on humanitarian approach as a single approach for the past seven years and we know that development process in Yemen has been set in a kind of freezing state since 2011. So it's more than a decade. It's about, about right now, 12 years ago, since, you know, the, the 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 cycle of the development projects and infrastructure rehabilitation and adding and employment, you know, there is nothing more. And people, in fact, you know, the impact of this issue is more even um, than the impact of the war itself. And then we talk about uh, the grievances, the national look at grievances and this, you know, just part of the failure of the National Dialogue Conference and the failure in addressing those grievances. But you can imagine now the amount of grievances accumulated and um, sometimes we just feel it's hard really to be addressed or how to be tackled really in the bath recovery. Uh, opportunities, we can look also at, you know, the pride side and, uh, you know, HECMA project was one of those really promising projects. The women's and youth engagement at the grassroots, uh, uh, grassroots level and peace building processes, whether uh, they are organized in initiatives or uh, in kind of projects like HECMA, but also working as individuals. And we have seen even women uh, uh, participated in uh, prisoner exchange, which is kind of more kind of men related or masculine kind of activities that women have no presence. So not to underestimate what's going on at the local level. The increased capacity in peace building, uh, combining that kind of tribal norms in resolving conflicts, but learning also from different uh, interventions and projects, new skills and new experiences, uh, accumulated experience with the uh, uh, civil society organization working on mobilizing the communities, providing different and integrated interventions, development, humanitarian, and more importantly, uh, the civil society organization is not only the bridge between uh, the international community or organ aid organization and uh, outside world or you know, the government or authorities, but also mediating between communities and local authorities, trying to, you know, bring those people all together. And this is really uh, one of the um, approaches that need to be built on in the coming um, or in the uh, recovery path is coming. Uh, another opportunity is to uh, maximize the role or roles for local powers and leadership uh, based on uh, the resilience that has been built over the uh, conflicting years. And that, you know, uh, with, you know, I cannot say it's in every place, but also it's something to look at and to examine and say what factors and leverage that supported that uh, local uh, influence and in other areas and whatnot. The other issue is slow shift towards integrated interventions or what we call tribal nexus. And this is really one of the important, um, uh, if I can see, directions. I just, in the past couple of years, they started, you know, the uh, humanitarian aid and international NGOs just to uh, try to uh, combine and mix that humanitarian aid uh, with other development work. And one of them is, um, for example, with the World Bank, maybe this is the largest one, and um, the German uh, uh, construction bank through the social uh, fund for development. So these are kind of different um, opportunities. They are scattered. Maybe they don't exist in every place and every community. However,
However, there's something that we can build on and try to scale up these practices as best practices. And I guess the best issue uh, or the best methodology that I, I will keep maybe mentioning it is the methodology of the Social Fund for Development and working with people. If you come now to uh, potential approaches, I'm trying to propose here some ideas, but those ideas in the two slides are not mine. They are, in fact, part of the uh, UNDB report, the last one uh, that uh, was released um, past year, assessing the impact of four in Yemen pathways for recovery. So the focus was uh, in that report is on development needs and priorities, calling for investment, I mean, in, in infrastructure, agriculture, education, health. That's true because you know as i said you know for uh, over a decade things you know they um, had stopped and nothing has been done uh, and add to that the impact of the war and the destruction that you know um, uh, affected uh, the infrastructure in all given rights if can or most of the given rights except two or three uh, which is really devastating to the lives of the people and planning for building blocks and planning uh, the building blocks here is meant to be uh, the agricultural investment uh, the economy and here talking about the empowerment of women but here I just guess empowerment of local communities including all I mean youth uh, marginalized women uh, uh, displaced people uh, and building the capacity of people and the governance quality. And I would leave that for my colleague Abdel Ghani just to talk about it uh, later on. So um, the potential approaches here, I would like to focus on three issues here, localization, inclusiveness, conflict sensitivity. Localization and inclusiveness with, and again, you know, some of the ideas and maybe in the questions of uh, the attendees were asking about how can we really in, invest or work on bottom up approach and so on. Again, I would see we do have really some of the good practices on the ground, the Social Fund for Development and other grassroots uh, organizations, they are excellent in that participatory approach, how to engage people in planning, deciding their own needs and find ways to do things in a better way and they created what we call the ownership and so th those are uh, uh, interventions or the work or the priorities or the projects that would come after identifying those priorities would be owned by the community so they would you know they would be sustained later on because it was going to be maintained by the community itself so the other issue is in localization that due to the fragmentation due to the divisions because of the war the interventions and the planning in the uh, recovery path need to be contextually relevant. I mean, uh, one of the la um, latest reports asking the priorities um, in about like 12 government rights, uh, asking people what they think would be the priorities and so on. It, yeah, there were there were similarities, and they are just talking about services, infrastructure, uh, you know, a job, a job and uh, livelihood opportunities. But in fact, the, the context right now is more uh, unique or more uh, diverse. So here to understand the context and what would work here will not necessarily work on the other one. So localizing and making it context uh, relevant, inclusive, but also having that process to be a kind of multi-track process. The conflict sensitivity here and culturally sensitive uh, approaches are needed not only in the interventions, but also to look at and addressing those different grievances. And here when we're talking about transitional justice mechanism and so on, just talk to the people, consult with people and say what is proper, what would be acceptable, how they perceive, for example, to overcome, to overcome revenge and those grievances. And here it has to be culturally and uh, conflict sensitive uh, ways to deal with that one. And here I would like uh, to talk about uh, the inclusivity, uh, inclusiveness and one of those uh, social segments that are left out and how it should be in a way or another dealt in a cultural sensitive and conflict sensitive way is looking at the issue of displaced people. And uh, as we know that, you know, the displaced people, and I guess everybody knows about, you know, the huge number already contained within the country borders, they couldn't go out because it just, we are all trapped, but the movement and coming, you know, from one place to another, it is very devastating. And addressing the, uh, the displacement issue as 
uh, only uh, um, uh, from a humanitarian point of view. Not thinking about the return is nothing yet. I mean, in seven more uh, years of the war, looking at what would um, help those people who would like to return to their uh, areas of origin and looking at their habitation and security. How about the coexistence for those who cannot really go back to their uh, uh, you know, communities uh, and the conflicts usually, and uh, I've witnessed it from a number of projects working uh, in um, uh, at the local level, how the hate speech and the conflict between IDBs and host communities are left unaddressed and only the only thing is just about, yeah, that you know, food basket that is distributed from now and then, and that's it. And there is a need here, for example, to do with displacement in the recovery path as a development issue looking for durable solution. Priorities should be also voiced by those. IDBs who are really in, in, in that trap of displacement, talking about services, access, talking about security, uh, building their capacity, and even enabling them to be or to play an active uh, uh, part in decision making, identifying their needs, and what would be the best way to um, handle uh, their issues, uh, either staying or going. But I mean, 4 million people is really a big number, and they need also to be part in the picture. Uh, uh, to wrap up, what I already proposed here, some of the uh, the ideas, uh, I would like to emphasize on something. Recovery should be built as a, a gradual and flexible process. We need to learn from it. There is no uh, one methodology that's going to be applicable. Looking at you know the, the local communities, working with the dynamicity of the lo local communities, while the you know the, the the work at the diplomacy level, you know those high level representation, those with armed and influence who can really, you know, uh, fight over you know, uh, their, um, what would be, you know, the benefits if we would agree on a, a, a process or a settlement and so on, military and political settlement. We would like to focus more and to take into account in the recovery uh, phase on localizing humanitarian development work, empowering local communities, strengthening local actors, local leadership, CSOs, private sector, and also building the trust and the partnership between these different parties who are on the ground, who are really suffering from that DDF sanction, the war, the impact, the conflict, and so on. Improve the inclusion of other segments and sectors and enhancing active community-based planning. Again, is talking about talk to people, consult with people, uh, look at the best practices either from the past and now or maybe other countries, let people decide what they want to do. So that should go hand in hand or parallel to the other, you know, political and uh, military settlements and peace negotiation and so on. I would stop here, but we would be happy you know, to receive any question. And um, yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this very rich uh, paper, uh, Sabria. I, I look forward to reading the full text. Uh, you've raised many, many issues uh, that uh, I think we will probably have a chance to come back to, but I just want to emphasize uh, the importance of participation that you referred to, but also the difficulty of participation in a polarized society, because you can't assume that everyone can participate at the same level and so on. Focusing on IDPs, I think is a great, uh, challenge in a sense. And I was really shocked to hear that there are 4 million in Yemen. That's almost 10% of the population being displaced. And I assume some of them have been displaced more than once. So their their capacity has, has really eroded. The point you make about humanitarian aid, that was very interesting because earlier yesterday and today, people have been calling for more humanitarian aid. What you're suggesting here is that humanitarian aid, no matter how more you put in, it's not going to replace uh, uh, the development. And if anything, it's going to drive it down and erode infrastructure and so on. So there are many, many interesting questions and, and issues to explore uh, in our uh, discussion. Uh, I would like now to move directly to our next uh, speaker, uh, Ustad Abdelghani, Mawjood Mana. Ustad Ghani, are you there? Yes. Okay. We will now move on to the presentation by Dr. Abdelghani Jarman, who will present a paper titled Governance and Post-Conflict Reconstruction in Yemen. In this paper, he will address the most sensitive transformations and changes 
relating to improving the the achievement of economic and governance indicators institutional institutional strength and economic quality dr abdelghani german is a researcher and consultant specialized in natural resource resources and sustainable development he has over 20 years of, of practical experience in oil field development and project management in yemen in the gulf states and in europe he has he holds an mba in knowledge management from the university of sheffield in the united kingdom and the phd in governance and sustainable development from the bucharest academy for economic studies dr abdul ghani please go ahead you have 15 minutes for your presentation thank you very much i would like to also thank the organizers for inviting me and if you'll allow me to present some of the results of the most recent study i conducted on yemen with regards to the topic of this study or the conference today there are a lot of numbers and figures and statistics but i think that's something that we engineers or those with an engineering background like to do we like to speak about in, in numbers that support the conclusions we reach any research or academic following the situation in yemen will find that all of the political security related and economic indicators in the country started to, to go down starting in the 1990s and all of the indicators have gradually gone lower and lower up until 2012. Peace and uh, security and stability were very weak. There were terrorist attacks throughout the country. The economy was very weak. And in the beginning of the 2000s, we tried in the oil sector to hold international uh, tenders for international companies to get involved in the oil sector in Yemen, but the progress that was made at the time was very weak. There's almost non-existence governance and the admi administrative corruption is widespread. While terrorism has reached the point where it has effect, uh, attacked the Ministry of Defense and the and the presidency itself. And so there's a lot of, this led to the uh, popular uprising and the revolution in 2011 and the political changes that occurred at the time as well as the successive political developments when the parties, when the political parties tried to contain these uprising and this momentum, but the situation escalated and the state is now in an almost, uh, is in a near state, a state of near collapse. The government lost its active, uh, its role as an act, as, as one of the main actor and the private sector is now the one that plays the role in supporting the economy. They tried to continue doing this. Civil uh, international organizations, whether inside or outside, are playing the role of a government, whether in Yemen or outside it, are playing the role of the government. And this has obviously affected the trust and confidence that civilians have in state institutions and in public officials in general. And so now we have a, a popular discontent with the performance of the government. With regards to the government's uh, performance, it is at, at the level of weak to non-existence. And this was obviously reflected in the international community as well. The, the international community has lost its confidence in the state and the state institutions, which has led to a decrease in the number of grants uh, given to the Yemeni government to deal with the war. International organizations, and the sp countries sponsoring the, the peace process in Yemen are trying to implement these projects themselves in Yemen. So with all of this, with this background that I have just presented or that was presented by the previous speakers in this conference, the question is what do we need to do? Is there a clear plan for reconstruction in Yemen? Do we have a document that includes this vision? that includes a strategy. As far as I knew, there might be a few documents or ideas or visions here and there, but there is not a clear and comprehensive plan for reconstruction in, in Yemen. And so this is why I believe the question is, are we trying to maintain Yemen and, and prevent collapse, or do we want to restore it to where it was in 2011, or do we want to try to uh, improve the situation to the, to the point that Yemeni people desire? And so I will present a number of issues relating to this. First of all, the importance of governance, 
governance is managing state resources effectively and efficiently in order to serve stakeholders and mainly the main stakeholder here is, civil, is civilians through management that applies all of the principles uh, the international the, the international standards for good governance around the world there are many studies and researches on the 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 importance of governance and so we have chosen some of these principles uh, of the principles of governance that we need to adhere to there's a clear indicator that the better the the country performs on governor in, in a governance index this is reflected on the performance of the state as well as on the economy uh, and investment and other economic aspects that help improve the livelihoods of, Ye of Yemeni people. There are international indicators that show that Yemen, that measure the effectiveness of governance in Yemen. And we will find that Yemen as a state, Yemen, Yemen is 136 out of 137. So we are just before the last country and usually it's us Yemen and Syria and, and a few uh, other Arab states, we there is a revolving revolving who is at the bottom of these lists with regards to the status index, with regards to the political transformation, the 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 transition of, of or the peace, transfer of power, as well as the governance index, which we got 1.6 out of 10, which is very low, and we were ranked 132nd, or with regards to the economic transformation in the country, where we are also 135th on the list. If we talk about in details, what are the major indicators that we are speaking about here, we will find that government effectiveness Government effectiveness is the one that has decreased significantly during the war, and this is a result of the lack of political stability and the prevalence of violence and terrorism throughout the country. These two factors primarily are the ones that have impacted the state in Yemen. With regards to rule of law, Yemen has enough laws, but unfortunately they are not being implemented, and this is one of the problems that we face uh, in Yemen, something that we need to keep in mind. In support of what Dr. Sabria said, we need to focus on building inclusive uh, societies, focusing on all segments, women, youth, IDPs, non-IDPs, minorities of different kinds, and we need to focus on them and focus on governing through these real principles and standards. This will be reflected in having open economies, whether in market access and being open to the rest of the world to attract investment. And this will be reflected in the livelihoods of the people and having empowered people, whether in their health care, uh, education, or living conditions in general. Going into some details about Yemen specifically, over the past 10 years, uh, I've over the past 10 years, I've, I've analyzed indicators from 2009 to 2019. We have found that the biggest factor that has led to this collapse that we see here as a result of the situation that Yemen is going through, is the uh, insecurity and the instability in Yemen. If we look at these three main uh, criteria, inclusive societies, open economy and empowered people, we will find that safety and security were the big, had the biggest losses from 2009 to 2019, followed by the government's indicator and the economic quality indicator. It is true that there are some of these, the natural environment, the education and health and living conditions have relatively improved. And this is because from 2009, 2019, there were, there were also natural disasters, whether the economic or the environmental pollution and Chebu and Hadramot, the natural disasters, these are all, have also impacted these indicators. If we had uh, expanded the time frame to 2022, these would have been read as well. If we look at safety and security uh, specifically, what does this mean necessarily? What are the main factors that affect safety and security? When we researched them, we found that politically related violence was the first indicator, which had a negative impact on the living conditions of the Yemeni people, terrorism also, which is widespread and something that we have not been able to overcome, as well as this uh, war on Yemen, which has obviously impacted the, the situation and governance. With regards to governance specifically, 
the biggest factor is government effectiveness, not not government integrity, not uh, uh, regulatory quality, rule of law. It's government effectiveness has seen the biggest losses during this time frame. And I will time frame and I'll explain more in depth about what exactly this means. There's another very important uh, factor that was mentioned by Dr. Sabria and some of the other panelists that which is social capital, that there seems to be a sort because of the loss of trust and confidence in the government among the people, they do not participate in any civic and social activities and events. Yet many people no longer believe in any of the different governments that are uh, governing the, the country. And so they have they're less and less concerned with the formal institutions of the state. And now the international organizations or, or organizations that have been able to uh, prove their effectiveness, like the Social Fund for Development, which is implementing, which is managing its projects, that have, uh, has high quality management of its projects. These are the only entities that are trusted by the Yemeni people, as well as by donors. The SFD is implementing projects that should have been implemented by state institutions, but due to the lack of trust and due to the corruption in these institutions, they are no longer trusted. If we speak specifically about government effectiveness, this means efficient use of assets and resources of different kinds. It also means responsibility and focusing on, on the implementation of projects in a suitable manner, as well as the the responsibility of of public officials to carry out their functions of their positions implementing projects in general also benefiting and learning from previous projects and continuing to develop them so that lessons from the past are learned from and trying to reflect these lessons in upcoming projects all of these factors are absent and i think the fifth uh, problem is the the lack of budget transparency the lack of financial transparency in general now more than six years of war the government of Yemen is being managed without any announced uh, formal state budgets. We don't know where the revenues from oil are going. We don't know where the resources are going, what they're being spent on, how much is being spent on each item in the bu budget. And there's absolutely no transparency when it comes to the state budget. All of these indicators reflect the mismanagement mismanagement by public officials and this has been reflected in the performance of the government in general a, a summary a quick summary of some of the most sensitive indicators if we want to improve safety and security in order to provide a suitable environment for reconstruction and for uh for the peace process like you like you said yourself there cannot be reconstruction if there is instability and insecurity because this will lead to the peace not being sustainable this will only be a, a temporary ceasefire and the war will restart if the peace process if the peace is not sustainable the first thing we need to do is we need to all work to to try to end the war and then pressuring the parties to the conflict to sit down at a table to negotiate implementing all of the principles and and standards of uh, justice and of reconciliation in general when we talk about government effectiveness the things that need to be done uh, the first thing is we need to focus on the important role played by the private sector as well as to support gov the government either by changing some of the administrative procedures, reform, administrative reform, capacity building, as well as the including uh, so societal uh, accountability and, and monitoring. In this way, the, the government can continue to support, the can resume supporting the economy and paying salaries and improving the livelihoods, as well as eradication of corruption and uh, reforming state institutions that are that have rampant corruption and this way we can be, ensure that the government will up implement all of the um, main principles of good governance which i mentioned more in detail I, I i won't read through all of these but these are very clear standards that can be implemented in building the state and building and rebuilding an economy as well as uh, implementing the the principles of justice and reconciliation, like uh, imp uh, reforming the military, integrating military units and in, uh, in certain armed groups, uh, 
supporting a culture of, of peace and peace building and also dealing with the impact of the war whether for idps and others like was mentioned and also working on reconstruction of everything that was destroyed during the war and either providing uh, the, the necessary physical and mental health care that they need so that we are able to overcome this war, which has had a very negative impact on the Yemeni people. I, I, I have this quote from my son, Ahmed, that I include that if we, if we do not deal with the problems and issues that we face, we will only continue to get weaker and weaker. And this is what I tried to show in the first slide, that since 1996, things have only been going down and getting worse. And I'm afraid that this collapse will continue to the point where Yemen is just a state made up of different authorities and factions that are only fighting with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Ghani Jarman, for this presentation. We'd also like to thank Ahmed for uh, summarizing all of this in a brief quote. And hopefully, the, the, this is representative of future generations that if we do not do the work we need to do now, then this will obviously have a negative impact on future generations of Yemenis. I think you've covered the topic of presentation very, very well. And governance is a very sensitive issue, especially with division, the divisions that we see and the fragmentation that we have in the country. You have a state that is internationally recognized, but it is not a state. And you also have uh, de facto authorities that are there, but uh, are not recognized. And these divisions have been reflected and have impacted the central bank and many other state institutions re related to governance. And I'm sure we will come back to these issues in the question and answer session. I also appreciate you, you reiterating or reaffirming that not all of the problems were caused by the war, that there were problems before. There was corruption. There was widespread corruption in Yemen even before the war and also problems with governance. There are also some geographic uh, geographical uh, factors that hinder the government from being effective uh, and carrying out its functions with obviously the vast space in Yemen, the small communities that are widespread throughout the country. It is very difficult to have a central state or a central method of governance. And I think there are important questions that you and Dr. Sabria can try to answer the question of localization of of decentralizing the the system of administration in Yemen uh, maybe the like the federal system that was presented in the political process uh, which led to a worsening of the situation and led to a conflict in Yemen we'll discuss these issues during the question and answer session but before that we will we will present the paper by Dr. Helen Lackner. Helen Lackner, for any uh, for anyone that knows uh, or that follows uh, Yemen, knows about her work. She is one of the most important researchers on Yemen, and Yemen and has had very long, more than 50 years of experience uh, in wor working in the country. Her paper today is called is titled "Long-Term and War-Related Constraints to Yemen's Socio-Economic Development." This paper goes into details on the different types of internal and external constraints that need to be addressed if the, the, to, to, to have hope for development, sustainable development in the future in the country. Unfortunately, Dr. Lackner was not could not be with us today, but she has sent a video of her presentation. And if uh, my colleagues could please please prepare it throughout this introduction. Some of her most important work included a book I think that you might all know called Yemen in Crisis. It is now the, the second edition of this uh, book is being published uh, by Rutledge. If we could start the video, please. Okay. Apologize for not being here in person for this meeting, even though it's on Zoom in any case. Uh, but as far as I am planning at the moment, I won't be anywhere near an uh, internet system on 15th of February. So apologies for being unable to answer any questions or engage in the discussion. 
And then, of course, I want to thank the organizers for this conference and for inviting me. And I certainly hope that it manages to come up with some positive suggestions of how to help uh, develop and how to help Yemen rebuild after this war when it happens. Uh, my talk is basically focusing on the constraints, on all the problems that are going to make things more difficult for Yemen and Yemenis in the future. So I'm afraid that it's not exactly full of optimistic and positive suggestions, but I do think it's extremely important to take these con constraints into consideration because that's the, it's only by really understanding and addressing the problems that it will be possible to overcome them. And pretending or ignoring them uh, will obviously not uh, enable the Yemenis to solve many of their fundamental problems. Now, what I'm going to concentrate on is mainly the long-term uh, internal constraints that are faced by Yemen and Yemenis. Um, and most of them are very fundamental and arise, you know, from long history as well as from the country's conditions. And then I will briefly talk about war-related factors and the role of uh, external agents, i.e. the international community, including the GCC. So the first basic environmental constraint, sorry, the first basic constraint that I think has to be addressed in Yemen is the issue of environmental degradation and global warming. Uh, this is an issue that is not uh, new in Yemen. The rest of the world seems to have woken up to it in the last two or three years. But for Yemenis, it's been a major problem for a long, long time. And people have got used to living with it, but that doesn't mean that they have a solution. And its main factors and features are first the unpredictability of rainfall patterns, which is something that was not the case 30 or 40 years ago, and which affects the, you know, the, a, a lot of other factors to do with the water situation. But it also results in deterioration of terracing, which is again a factor which has been a combination of social and historical as well as climate related factors. And of course, the water situation, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, but the other factors are also desertification and rising sea levels. Rising sea levels is a phenomenon which has not yet been immediately noticeable, but if we look at the next 10 or 20 years, it's something that will affect not only three of the country's major cities, i.e. Hodeida, Aden, and Mukalla, but also a lot of other smaller towns, let alone the hundreds of fishermen official settlements along the two coasts. So it's, an, it's a problem that does need to be dealt with. The second element, which is of course related to the environment, is the issue of water scarcity. Now, Yemen has been a water scarce country for a very long time. Uh, this is a well-known fact, uh, but it's been ag aggravated and made much worse by various causes which have been increasingly important in the last decade or two, which are basically the ongoing rapid population growth, i.e. there are more and more people needing water and the quantity of water is not, re is not increasing. A second aspect, and which is relevant in agriculture, and before I go on, I think it's worth remembering two things. One is that still 70% of Yemen's population live in rural areas, and more than 50% of them depend on agriculture to a smaller or greater extent. So the fact that, uh, that diesel operated pumps for extracting water and, and more recently electric and even now solar operated pumps are all having a very fundamental impact on the availability of groundwater. And here again, it's important to remember that at the moment, or at least pre-war, and on that front, I suspect things haven't changed very much, the amount of water that is extracted every year is about one third more than the amount that is replenished. So we have a situation where basically the country is running out of water. Now, the impact of this 
is, you know, a multiple series of aspects. I mean, first we have um, forced migration. People are having to leave villages when the water runs out. Where do they go? They go where there's water, they go where there are people, and that is something that's likely to worsen and increase social tension. It reduces the yield for water, or oh, sorry, it yields for agriculture, and particularly it's the poorer farmers who run out of water and have because the wealthier farmers have deeper pumps and they are therefore able to extract water and the poorer farmers are basically forced eventually to sell their lands. It's more difficult for women and children to collect water. They have to go further and wait longer. And in the urban areas, you know, we have a lack of urban water systems. I mean, number one, for example, in both Sana and Thais, only about 40% of houses are connected to the municipal network. And in Sana, they were getting water once or twice a week. In Thais, they were getting water, and I'm not making a mistake, I'm saying this correctly, they were getting water about once every two months on that system. So basically, most people were dependent on trucking water and on tanker supplies. So all these factors are very important factors. And of course, the scarcity of water has a serious impact on potential economic development, uh, both in agriculture, which should definitely be focusing on rain-fed agriculture, and on different types of crops uh, and you know basically create situations where the where what is used is what is available and is maxim and its value is maximized so all these are basic fundamental uh, environmental constraints i would say then of course you know yemen to a much lesser extent than other countries in the peninsula but still to some extent was largely dependent on oil and gas. Well, the oil uh, supplies are very low and have been basically uh, reducing very significantly and would uh, could run out any time, or probably if the war hadn't interrupted extraction, they probably would have run out by now. The amount of gas that is available is quite significant, but the income that is likely to produce is much lower than one might have hoped for largely because of the massive cost of the investment of the infrastructure to produce it. Now, another element of the, of the constraints is being the past economic policies. Now I'm talking primarily about the economic policies under the Saleh regime, but basically in the 10 years since he stopped being president, um, the economic policies haven't fundamentally changed. They didn't change under the transition. And since the war started, uh, there's basically been no attempt to my knowledge or to develop serious alternative economic policies by anyone running any parts of the country. And basically what those policies were focused on is you had a, a complete convergence between Saleh's objectives and the strategies of the international financial institutions who were giving Yemen supposedly aid. I you were talking about the World Bank, the IMF, and other uh, aid, international agencies, as well as most of the, of the bilateral funders. And basically what they were focusing on were neoliberal strategies. In agriculture in particular, it was focused on export of irrigated crops, uh, which again, from what we've just said, was privileging the wealthier groups rather than the poorer, um, and worsened the, the water shortage, for obvious, obviously. A second element of those policies was the nepotism. So although the aid sector was trying to reduce, for example, subsidies, they never did it with any determination. So that allowed you know, the continued export of diesel at the great profit of certain individuals and did very little for the population at large. Another element of the international uh, development policy was to be against corruption, which of course we're all in favor of. I mean, we're all in favor of being against corruption, obviously. And but the process, what they did was basically to weaken state institutions at the expense, uh, to, at the, to the benefit of what they set up of basically parastatal such which were operating on a private sector model which is supposed to be better 
the prime examples of this were the Social Fund for Development and the Public Works Project, which have done a lot of good work, but they have also very seriously undermined and contributed to the fragmentation and the inability of the state to carry out its responsibilities. The next thing I want to talk about is social fragmentation, which is an impact, which is something that will have an impact on development in the future. Uh, we've had under the Saleh regime, and it's certainly continuing now, the encouragement of sectarianism. I mean, the rise of the Houthi movement is part of the sectarian operation. The rise of the Islamists and of the Salafis has been another element. And all of these were basically contributing to fragmenting and dividing Yemeni society. A second element, of course, was the rise of the southern separatists, which is something that is still you know, very relevant today and will remain so probably uh, once they, you know, in the future. And finally, you did also have general social fragmentation between the increasing uh, number of people who were poor and on the margin and the smaller number of very privileged people. Uh, I think I'm not doing that well on time, so I'm going to rush through um, the next element, which is basically another very important element for economic development in the future, which is the status of the Yemeni labor force. First, we have a labor force of a, people of a very low level of education, even those who have gone through the entire education system, including university, tend to come out with skills that are not enormously useful for a modern economy. There's still an enormously high rate of illiteracy amongst women and the one, and I think a rising one amongst men or amongst boys with the fact that you've had millions now, according to the UN, you have two million children who are out of school. So you're talking about a large number of people who have not who are not having any education and when we come out of this war which has now been as we know going on for you know for seven years uh, you're going to have a lot of people who have no experience of education and possibly no even interest in education because their perspective on the world has been focused on weapons and arms. At the same time, you have a labor force that's been growing at almost 5% per annum and therefore the need for new jobs. And all of this within the context that we have just mentioned of the difficult fundamental constraints. So I'll briefly talk about the future, or sorry, not about the future yet, about the war related and the external factors. The first one I've just really talked about, which is the militarization, the fact that you have a whole generation of young men in particular, whose experience is war and fighting, and who, you know, many of whom have been involved in the fighting, primarily to support their families. I mean, let's not, uh, I doubt that most of the young men who are being killed on a daily basis are, uh, you know, in, in the fighting in order to promote an ideology. I think most of them are there because their families are hungry and starving and they are desperately trying to help them. But that doesn't prevent the fact that they, you know, when it comes to demobilization, when it comes to a post-war future, they don't have that that can be used in a civilian society. The second factor you have is a years now of dependence on international humanitarian assistance, which does have an impact on uh, giving people the feeling that they have to, that they expect to be receiving a lot of handouts. Now, there's a positive side to this, of course, which is a lot of young Yemenis have been trained and have had a lot of opportunities in running organizations, and therefore they've developed a whole number of skills. But I think one has to look at the you know, dependence at the years and years of dependence on international humanitarian assistance as fundamentally a factor which needs to be addressed, at least when you're talking about the future. And finally, I want to talk about, you know, the influence, the future now really about the influence of the international financial institutions and the international community. Yemen is in the Arabian Peninsula, as I think we all know. If you look at the other states in the Arabian Peninsula and the way they are governed, it seems pretty unlikely that the neighboring states or indeed the international financial institutions 
would support economic de development policies which are primarily focused on the interests of the Yemeni people and of the majority of Yemeni people. Uh, even if they did what the uh, they developed policies which would be perfectly suitable for their own populations, this is not similar to what is needed in Yemen. Urban populations in the rest of the peninsula are primarily urban, primarily highly educated, and dependent on, on imported foreign labor for a high percentage of its economic activities. Yemen is dependent 100% on its national population and is, as I said earlier, primarily rural. So the kind of policies that are likely to be promoted and suggested and indeed financed uh, by these states are not likely to be very effective for the Yemenis. And I think here again, we have to remember that, you know, the conferences that have taken place and most of the discussion that talks about Yemeni uh, future, about post-war Yemen, talks about on the assumption that billions of dollars or whatever will be provided by the Gulf states or by the GCC states. Now, I'm sure the GCC states will provide something, but I'm also sure that they will not provide anything like the kind of amounts that are being mentioned uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, first, political, they are not that keen on what's happening in Yemen, but also if you look at their own needs and their own development policies, um, they are going to focus, particularly in coming years, following the crises and with the reduced demand for hydrocarbons at the world level and all these different factors, they are likely to be primarily focused on their own interests. So I think the likelihood of the amounts of cash needed for development in Yemen in future is going to be a lot less than is expected and than is needed. And particularly, it will not likely go where it would be of greatest use to the Yemeni population. So it would therefore not respond to people's needs. Now, I know that what I've said is pretty negative and depressing, but I think we need to remember that Yemen has a very young and dynamic and energetic population, that it's been able to do many, many things. There are sectors of potential, uh, there are big sectors of potential. I mean, fisheries have been overexploited and misused for decades, but they can be revived and they can be expanded. You can have uh, rain-fed agriculture developed if it's if serious inputs, uh, technical and research and financial inputs are put into it. You could, you know, you, there is a desperate need for a high quality education and that is a very long term thing because it really will take at least 10 years to produce a new generation of highly skilled, competent people. And that's something that, well, like everything else, should have been started right from the beginning. So I think, you know, tourism is another potential. I mean, Yemen has this long and wonderful culture. It has beautiful sceneries and geography. It has, you know, ar architecture, archaeology. It has any number of cultural um, features that could attract a lot of people and a lot of research. And all these things, if managed well, could provide Yemen with, if not a wealthy future, at least a reasonable future. And I think it's only too urgent for the situation to come, for fighting to stop and people to focus on these needs. So thank you for listening. And again, I apologize for not being around to answer any questions. And also for the fact that things fade and light up when I'm talking on Zoom. It's always like that. I've never understood why and there's nothing I can do about it. Thank you. A very warm thank you to Helen. Uh, she obviously reflected 50 years experience in Yemen. And I think she's given us a very pragmatic view, although it was maybe focused a little bit on the challenges. She did end it with the end her presentation with a, with a number of opportunities which uh, I'm sure we all agree with. And uh, uh, ultimately it is down to young generation that is up and coming, pushing ahead. It's the Sabriya, the Abdel Ghani, the Rafat of Yemen that will really help turn Yemen round. I, uh, the only thing I 
maybe uh, would take an issue with Hanover is the relationship with the Gulf. It is just there, you know, we cannot really separate the Gulf from Yemen. And if anything, the war in Yemen, I believe, and the increased security threats for the Gulf states from their neighbors and from the region will probably drive them to realize eventually that Yemen is the hinterland of the Gulf. It's the strategic depth of the Gulf states, both in terms geographically, people, labor, and so on. And hopefully there will be a time when we see the Gulf states standing constructively with Yemen and uh, in a united way. Uh, we have uh, now uh, 10 uh, minutes or so for uh, Q, uh, Q&A, maybe 15 minutes, and then I will uh, summarize and bring the conference to a conclusion. So let's start with some of the questions, and we'll start with, with uh, uh, Sabria. Sabria, I may have misinterpreted what you said about humanitarian aid, and I'm reminded here by uh, one of our colleagues in the Q&A, that it is not Husniya uh, al-Qadri. says, we don't need less humanitarian aid. We basically need different aid. You know, the humanitarian aid has got to be done in a way that supports uh, development. And the problem is maybe in the way aid is done and not necessarily in, in the amount or, or the, the money that is required. But while you address this issue, I also would like you maybe to address the issue of the social fund for development. I mean, the social fund for development has been there forever. Can't you remember uh, how how long um, I led an evaluation for it of its work some years ago, and it has managed to continue throughout the war, which is quite remarkable. If you could just highlight for us, from your perspective and you, the way you call for localization, what is it that the lo- the fund has done right, and also reflect on what Helen said in terms of the negative aspect of the fund that it has bypassed the responsibility from the state and as such led to deterioration of state capacity. Over to you, Sabria. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to speak Arabic in the presentation, so I don't know how to speak in the Arabic. So I will... Uh... Sorry. Sorry, respect. Uh, actually, I respond in Arabic, actually because I promised uh, participants. For uh, Dr. Hasni uh, Al-Qadri, actually, what she stated is right. Uh, I did not uh, call uh, for the elimination of the humanitarian aid because we will still need it. Uh, 20 million people are uh, still in need for one form of uh, humanitarian aid, and the hunger uh, indicators are still very high in the country, and we have uh, poverty pockets. Uh, uh, but uh, even in the recovery phase, uh, humanitarian aid is required and should be there, but it should go in parallel with the development. We need a different approach uh, because uh, at the beginning of the war, the focus was on distributing food baskets. For someone living in Yemen, uh, I have uh, conducted different assessments and this way is a failure because these uh, food baskets are sold in the market. The value of the food basket is $50 and it is uh, sold in the market for 10 or 15. And then we had different approach, which is the cash for work and that cash for work approach made a difference actually, but still it has some flaws in it. We, yes, we still need humanitarian aid, but the approach should be different and should be in line with the recovery and the reconstruction. For the Social Fund for Development, SFD, yes, it stopped for a while at the beginning of the war and it was difficult to continue because the donors withdrew primarily international organizations that are operating in stable areas for development, including the World Bank and the KFW. And they came back actually a few years after the onset of the war uh, be, uh, because the humanitarian aid as a single approach did not work. And uh, for many years, uh, no development needs in the country were addressed. So these international organizations came back and they adopted some reliable approaches uh, and uh, they relied on the social fund for development. 
Uh, I am aware of different projects of the Social Fund for Development, especially projects funded by KFW. Actually, they reconstruct educational and health facilities. And for water projects, uh, they construct projects. And they are uh, adopting the participatory approach and the users uh, committees, but not uh, with the same momentum that we had before. The SFD succeeded in creating the so-called the village councils. And these councils brought together women, youth, and men from the local communities. And the beautiful thing about that uh, is that it uh, continued for so long and people understood this approach and embraced it because traditionally it was there in the uh, society. Uh, so uh, people gather in the village in order to help each other or to face any crisis and emergency. It's a direct approach or methodology that is uh, easy to be understood by the communities. And now different projects are adopting that, including the peace building projects. So they call them the uh, community-based uh, committees or the reconciliation committees or things like that. What I mean is that we have to have uh, slow strides, gradual strides, and then we can have new approaches for development and aid. Thank you, Sabria. Dr. Abulghani. We have here uh, a number of questions. I'll try to combine them in one question concerning the localization, the local level, and the governance. Is it a top-down approach or bottom-up and the issue of federalism? So we always call for governance and to have uh, proper local authorities, but uh, there is a kind of disagreement concerning to what extent uh, we decentralize. Another question related to that from another colleague is about the tribalism and tribes. So we heard in previous papers, uh, speakers calling for having a role for tribes in resolving conflicts because traditionally tribes had a very important role. How do we combine between tribes and the state and the government at the present time? Okay, so what does it mean to I'll start from the last question. The tribe, generally speaking, uh, we had uh, different norms uh, in Yemen. For example, in 1962, different parties uh, tried to use the tribes and to attract the tribes to their side. In 1994, tribes were used in the war as well. And now there is a very prominent role for tribes in this conflict and this war. I believe uh, tribes had a role that prevented the collapse of the state in Yemen. As we understand in Yemen, we have uh, fragile institutions uh, and uh, the, we do not have a strong institutional state uh, and we haven't been a state for years. Uh, so the institutions are not deeply rooted in our uh, societies and therefore we cannot abolish uh, the role of the tribe, but we need to frame it uh, properly so the uh, tribe uh, can adopt certain standards and certain priorities in order to be utilized to serve the existence of the state and the authority of the state. So this is one point. Uh, the second point concerning the decentralization of the localities, there are two avenues. It's either you uh, create governance uh, for every ministry or every institution, or the state itself as a state adopts uh, strategies uh, to establish governance, uh, to establish, for example, good governance council. It should not be sovereign or executive council. It should be legislative council, regulatory, to develop the standards and the criteria for uh, governance, uh, starting from the small local authorities up to the presidency of the republic as a comprehensive system that is presented to the people or to the government in order to be implemented consistently consistently because the partial solutions will not be useful and therefore we need to have an integrated or comprehensive solution that starts from the small village councils so let's organize the people locally and people will rule themselves by themselves because 
it's not no more democracy or socialism it's the people who are taking the decisions and therefore it's a bottom-up approach if you allow me i follow up on this issue because it's important uh, people rule uh, themselves uh, bottom up and local councils do you think that the war and the failure of the state has empowered and emboldened these local councils or is it the opposite now they have responsibilities for example but they do not control the resources the the resources helen talked about in her paper so where from comes the resources for these councils in order to govern their daily affairs well they need to have the management with the best possible resources they have the local councils now with their official status they are in the forefront uh, they are in a very difficult position there is a war in the country and they have different uh, parties uh, and uh, these local councils control certain localities and therefore they are in the heart of this war or conflict and they are assuming certain responsibilities. They have revenues, they have resources, and they have donations, for example, and they have uh, benevolent individuals who are helping. And therefore, there are a number of difficult, for example, projects that were done by local councils. For example, we have seen roads and some water projects constructed and funded by uh, some uh, charities and people living abroad, diaspora, Yemeni diaspora, because they have seen that the state is absent and therefore they mobilized themselves. The local people mobilized themselves and they constructed projects for themselves. Thank you, Ms. Sabria. There is a question from Sosan Rifai, and I'll try to rephrase it probably. It's about the issue of accountability. <laughs> It's about the accountability, the local accountability of the donors. Now, you are in a situation, as you indicated, there are different tracks and there are countless projects and uh, people implement activities, the civil society and different institutions, they do different things. But accountability from the beneficiaries uh, themselves, uh, from the people who receive the aid or the beneficiaries of these projects. First of all, what's the nature of this accountability? Can people hold accountable the uh, the donors and the different institutions? Uh, so can they hold accountable the local agents and then the international donors? There are demands to have international aid focus more on the development, uh, for example, and uh, well, the, thank you, Samson, for this question. Accountability is a very important issue. Sadly, the issues of accountability move in one direction, or the accountability is from the donors to the implementers. Uh, what is happening is that there are restrictions and conditions. Sometimes they are very difficult for the civil society to meet. I salute the civil society in Yemen uh, to be able to operate uh, despite all, all the odds and the difficulties. Uh, we have seen some civil society organizations created by some political parties in order to uh, control resources, but we have seen some very strong organizations which shifted from the development to the humanitarian activities and now from the humanitarian back to the development track and the uh, peace building. So what is happening with these organizations is that they have proven to be resilient in responding to the demands and the requirements of the donors. And the only way of donors to reach to the uh, people, to the communities, and even to the government and the authorities, the de facto authorities and other authorities, all these parties were unable of reaching to the communities. So the access was through this bridge, which is the civil society organizations. So we need not to underestimate the role of the civil society. We understand that there is corruption, but uh, it's amplified sometimes. Now, uh, the question, this question about the accountability, we have the accountability from the donor to the civil society organizations. Now, there should be accountability from the side of the end users. Uh, well, there are some 
very weak mechanisms that exist now. There is, for example, a box for complaints uh, and people can lodge complaints, for example, but in the uh, local communities, there is illiteracy and people cannot write, uh, they cannot make phone calls. And when we go, for example, to the field and try to conduct evaluations, so we ask them about the grievances and the complete mechanism. People do not have an idea that such mechanism exists. Uh, so accountability is not there. And if the, the local communities, they see in front of them, the civil society organizations only, they do not see the ultimate donors. So the accountability from communities to the donors is not there. At the beginning of uh, the conflict years, UNICEF conducted a study about women and accountability. And one of the UN agencies, I, I believe they commissioned another study about uh, accountability uh, from the beneficiaries to the donors. They did not uh, go to the field. They did not conduct the interviews for a number of reasons, including, for example, the, the uh, people in power, they, they did not allow them and they have restricted their movement. So there are different obstacles. But the issue of accountability is very important. It is currently one direction is from the donor to civil society organizations, the implementers. But we have seen recent initiatives. Youth, for example, they have started a network on social media and they say sometimes, where is the money? And where is the aid? And they try to obtain papers and documents and they publish them on Facebook and Twitter concerning the different projects and their funding and how funds were spent. And this shows this self-initiative and we have potentials in the country that we can tap on, but we need to organize people and to frame them in order to have some serious mechanism which we can build on. Thank you very much, uh, Sabria, and shukran, Dr. Abdul Ghani, and uh, thanks also to Helen for this uh, panel, uh, which was very rich. And I'm looking forward to reading the final papers. I believe that we will have a number of very important papers related to the future of Yemen. And as uh, indicated by the US Special Envoy yesterday, Maybe the year 2022 will be the year of peace in Yemen. Uh, we are very optimistic and we hope that this is the case. We have reached now the end of this academic conference and I will request uh, Dr. Khalil and Rafat to open their cameras if we have them here. And if they have any final remarks, we can provide them. I'll try very briefly to summarize some of the key points that were raised during this conference, which was uh, held actually in a very critical time, very important time, and because now the focus is on uh, reviving the political process and therefore there is a need for such a conference and other conferences in order to emphasize on the important role of Yemen in the region and the world and the need to stop this war and to initiate reconstruction and the reintegration of Yemen into the Arab region. Maybe you have noticed during this conference that we tried and we were very keen to have kind of a bridging between the academic side, the politics uh, and the action on the ground, we tried as well to balance between the researchers from inside Yemen and international researchers who are specializing in Yemen. And we tried also to strike a balance between male and female researchers and speakers. And we tried as well to balance between different political opinions and perspectives. What was unique about this uh, meeting or conference uh, was that we have heard uh, from representatives uh, from Ansarullah, representatives from the government in addition to the UN Special Envoy and the US uh, Special Envoy. The United States, as I have indicated, uh, plays a very important role in Yemen. We hope that it plays uh, a, an increasingly important role in the conflict uh, in Yemen. 
when the U.S. Special Envoy was appointed, there were great expectations that uh, this is the time uh, for the peace process to move and to be revived in Yemen. Participants shed light on a number of ideas and I cannot list them now in these few minutes, but uh, there was a general agreement uh, that there is a need for de-escalation as the uh, zero step. And there was emphasis by all parties that there is no military solution for the conflict in Yemen and that uh, the conflict has to be resolved through a peaceful process in a way or another. And there should be a political settlement for the conflict in Yemen and that this uh, settlement should not exclude any party, Yemeni party. Military operations from all sides cannot lead to anything but an increase in destruction and increase in the suffering and also in hindering the peace process. This was also a point of consensus among the panelists. Some of the participants, the panelists also spoke about the most recent attacks and their strategic value, even though there was a consensus that these attacks have only further complicated the conflict and the overall situation uh, surrounding the conflict in Yemen. There was a, a, something that we heard repeatedly from the panelists on the, the difficult situation that Yemen has reached, the catastrophic situation with severe humanitarian needs. We heard recently about 4 million about there being 4 million internally displaced persons, about the very high hum level of humanitarian needs and the gaps in humanitarian assistance, in addition to many of the important development projects being suspended and the conflicts or dispute and the speculation of the currency, the differences or divisions in the central bank, which leads to something that I think we can, we can say is the de-development of Yemen. And despite the the limited or humble achievements in the past, the war has only gone in the opposite direction and has undone many of these positive effects. We have also spoken about the importance about uh, the importance of trying to think outside the box when it comes to the peace process and in innovation and creativity in different ways, not necessarily ways that are similar or ones that uh, that are in line with what the, the, the roadmaps that the international community has gotten used to, but ones that rely on the Yemeni approaches and Yemeni ways of thinking. Like the panelists and the recent academics have mentioned, there are many Yemeni traditions and customs in conflict resolution or in conflict management that can be used to do this. To ensure that there is progress towards development in the future. There was also a paper on a paper that by Dr. Majid Al Ansari that assessed the role of the Gulf states and the possibility uh, of them of any of the Gulf states playing the role of a mediator in the conflict in Yemen. And he also spoke about the potential role of Oman, of Qatar, of Kuwait in resolving this conflict. For me, I think these were some of the most important points that we discussed, but in, we are looking forward to the, uh, the, uh, the editing of these papers, all of the papers presented to this conference in a single book. And we hope that this is the first of a series of conferences. It's very important to have real uh, and uh, Yemeni participation from stakeholders, from actors, from researchers, because despite all of the challenges that we've discussed, I believe that human capital in Yemen is what really sets Yemen apart. We did not go into the, 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 the details about uh, the, the Yemenis abroad and their participation in building and in providing development and even security throughout the Gulf and in the rest of the world and their contributions to these societies. I would like to end there and give an opportunity to my colleagues and my partners in organizing this conference, starting with uh, Rafat. Rafat, if you would like to speak. 
please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultan. I think you've summarized everything really well. We're very happy for this uh, for this event and for our partnership with you. We have gotten many many messages that encourage these kinds of meetings and to have these direct discussions, whether by the parties to the conflict or listening to specialists and analysts and researchers. We want to reiterate that all of these sessions are recorded. They are available on social media channels, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter of the three part organizing partners, and you can go back to them and listen to them at any time. We also uh, re uh, received a lot of criticism about the lack of representation of one side or the other of certain viewpoints or opinions or topics that we were unable to address. Uh, and hopefully there will be m more activities like this in the future that will allow us to uh, address and to discuss all of these other topics and all of these issues that unfortunately we did not have enough time to address now. Thanks once again to all of the panelists, to the participants, to the audience, everyone who was with us over the past two days. And we hope that this, uh, this conference was as beneficial for you as it was to us to listen to all of these experts. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rafat, Dr. Khalil. Uh, let me say this, I'm also in uh, full agreement uh, with the summation uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Sultan and uh, Rafat had uh, just uh, given us uh, with regards to our uh, feedback that we have received. Uh, the feedback is similar here. I think it was a very constructive uh, and, and useful uh, exercise in terms of our uh, cooperation together, the, th the three organizations. Uh, to produce this valuable and very timely uh, conference. And we're looking forward uh, to see uh, the results, the, the final outcome in terms of edited uh, papers and a publication uh, to sum up uh, the deliberations uh, of, uh, of this conference. And as I said at the beginning of this conference, what motivated us to be part of this is our longstanding joint uh, commitment uh, all three of us uh, who sponsored uh, this uh, event in terms of commitment to a peaceful solution of conflicts in the region and including uh, definitely Yemen. Uh, we haven't been very happy with the conduct of things and the escalations over the past seven years. And it is our hope that uh, in a humble way, uh, these de deliberations uh, and the contributions by both practitioners and experts uh, will sensitize people more to do uh, a lot more for the people of Yemen uh, to put an end to the bloodletting that we have witnessed uh, over the past seven years. And, uh, you know, enough is enough is what I said, and I uh, uh, abide by that. And just a word of thank you to the staff of all three organizations. I was uh, uh, not to be biased, by, uh, but our audience need to know that uh, we've worked together in a seamless way. And uh, I appreciate uh, the, the effort uh, of, of all uh, the staff, uh, the unknown soldiers uh, behind an event of this caliber. Uh, there are you know, dozens of people who have been working tirelessly uh, for weeks and months uh, to, to put this uh, event together. So thank you uh, to all. And we look forward to a future cooperation on uh, equally important issues in the region. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalil. It is worth mentioning that on our side, at least, my team is made of young uh, ladies and they've done a great job throughout. Uh, and I would like to thank them very much. It was their first time to manage a complex uh, uh, conference like this one. They've done a great job. I would also like to thank our audience, uh, those who participated with us. At this moment, we're concluding with almost 100 participants, which is great. We have reached stages where 300 people uh, registered uh, to, to attend the conference. And uh, that is a reflection of the uh, importance of the subject and also the importance of what Dr. Khalil referred to earlier, the art of conversation. I hope that we can continue to have more opportunities for this kind of uh, exchanges. Shukran jazeelan lil jamia wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you all very much and goodbye. And we will see you in future uh, conferences and activities by our three centers in the future. Thank you all very much.